In America, everyone counts, and the 2020 census is how that great promise is kept. Respond today online, by phone, or by mail, and help inform hundreds of billions in funding for education, health programs, and more. Shape your future. Start at 2020census.gov. One of the issues that Donald Trump thinks that he uh, can win on is the economy. He's proclaimed uh, he's the great job creator, how he built this economy, which is a lie which is a huge lie. It was, again, a thriving economy when President Barack Obama uh, left office. Uh, but Moody uh, Analytics uh, Analysis, they've released a report that says Joe Biden's economic plan will create 18.6 million jobs in his first term. That's 7.4 million jobs more than, than Donald Trump. Biden's plan is estimated to create 66% more jobs than Trump in the next four years. Joining us to break this thing down is Dr. William Spriggs. He's an economist for Howard University. Dr. Spriggs, uh, look, uh, the, the issue of the economy is one that is paramount. You've got these white conservatives, these white men who are supporting Donald Trump. Uh, you've got Joe Biden trying to appeal to these white women uh, who back Trump 53% of the vote. Uh, and 53 percent of white women who voted for Donald Trump in 2016. This Moody's analysis, um, how did they reach this conclusion? Well, it's, it, it's based on sort of common sense economics. It's the things that we know generate jobs. And what we got from Trump was if we give massive tax cuts to corporations and to the richest people on the planet, they're going to make investments. Well, we gave them the tax cuts. They didn't make the investments. And then we hit COVID and we've lost more jobs than when he took office. And because the corporations squandered the tax cuts on stock buybacks, we didn't have a better financial position for our corporations going into the downturn. What you see in the Biden plan is what we know makes jobs. You invest in infrastructure and job creation. You, uh, you, you actually talk about real job creation. So that is what's going to make things different. The effect of increasing investment in higher education, getting a better qualified workforce, that's what makes jobs grow. Um, this, of course, I mean, is is a big deal because, again, Trump swears and because he's this great businessman and he's out there talking about how he's done so much for black, for black people and things are just going so well. Well, if you look at these numbers here, first of all, uh, the unemployment rate for African-Americans was 7.2, 7.7 when he was inaugurated. Now it's around 14 percent. It's doubled. Now he he, he loves to ignore uh, COVID. Just like just like uh, Larry Cutlow yesterday was uh, talking to the folks uh, and he was getting pressed by a Fox News radio reporter who kept talking about, no, no, what are the poverty numbers now? What are they now? And Cutlow, well, why are you nitpicking? He's like, oh, that's not nitpicking. Uh, but if, if but if the Biden plan is going to create 18.6 million jobs, that has to benefit black people. It's designed to benefit black people because a large part of the investment are in the types of jobs that we hold. So the infrastructure includes the care economy. And we need an expansion of that right now. Everybody understands that with kids being stuck home that you can't get labor force participation back up for women. So you have to have a strategy that's aimed at helping women get a path to the job market. That is essential for creating more jobs. The difference between what Trump did, trickle-down economics, does not generate net new jobs because it doesn't expand opportunity. It just lets fat companies feed off of skinny companies. When you expand opportunity, you're making the pie bigger. That's how you really create net new jobs. And that means you have to give opportunities to people who don't have them. That's how you create more jobs. Um, and so uh, this this analysis, hopefully folks will actually uh, see that. I want to bring my panel right here as well. Uh, 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 Reese, when we talk about the economy, again, Trump want, Trump has tried to convince people. He's tried to convince and a lot of people, black folks and others who bought, buy into this, some, this notion that, oh, he's this great businessman. 
The debt has exploded in America. That's first. Uh, they don't want to deal with that. And the reality is we're not seeing the incomes rise and we're seeing companies pocketing significant amounts of money. They took the money from the tax cut, reinvested in the stocks, uh, which only helped the shareholders, not the workers. Right. But unfortunately, he is winning on the economy based on polls. People believe that Donald Trump is stronger on the economy than Joe Biden, even though the entire strength of Trump's economy is what he inherited from the Obama-Biden administration and ran into the ground with his abdication of authority and responsibility to adequately address COVID-19. So this is a messaging issue that the Biden campaign has indisputably and quantitatively their policies are better. The problem is, number one, you have a media that's interest, a mainstream media, let me be clear about that, that's interesting in perpetuating the Trump Republican Mitch McConnell narratives rather than doing reporting like what you're doing right now and showing the different analysis that shows that the Biden-Harris plan creates 10 million more jobs than the Trump plan. And these are jobs that are needed because we've lost millions of jobs throughout this COVID crisis. And as you pointed out, even as jobs have returned, not a net pop, not a net gain, but just a, a return, black people have been left behind in the return of these jobs. And so this is a message that could be a winning message if the Biden campaign, I'm not criticizing them, but what I should what I'll say is that the Biden campaign should spend the next 39 days talking the economy, health care, and Supreme Court. Those are the issues that they need to hammer home more than anything else. And I had mentioned a couple episodes or a couple weeks ago that this issue in particular resonates with black men voters as well as black women voters. And so uh, I think that people have to understand that economic issues are issues that all demographics are, are interested about. And it's a top issue for many people, COVID being second, depending on whether you're talking to Republicans or Democrats, they, they switch. But the economic... Uh, the economic plan is a winning plan if they talk about it and continue to talk about it and really, really push this narrative. Um, this was a particular chart, uh, Erica, that was put together on so social media, and they, and they, and they show that it's a um, re real GDP under different election scenarios, if there's a Republican sweep, current policy, Democratic sweep, and what the baseline is. Uh, and they show that real GDP and jobs if it took place under Democrats. In fact, one of the groups, I'll try, I'm going to try to find that uh, ad. One of the groups, groups against Trump dropped an ad that even showed uh, Trump stating in his own words how the economy proved, improved under Democrats. <laughs> of course. And I agree with Reese. I think that particularly with this last stretch that we're moving into as it relates to the election, that those three things are real touchstones that should be hammered because the stock market is not the economy. When you're talking about the jobs and job loss, people want to work because they want to be able to pay their rent. They want to be able to pay for their utilities and they want to be able to provide for those people that are dependent on them and their households. When you're talking about health care for them to also talk about how this very same regime is in court fighting to take away tens of millions of um, people, Americans, health care in a global pandemic where we still don't have a national testing strategy and uh, where Donald Trump believes that his response will be to lie about having a vaccine ready and then also um, talk about these uh, 33 million people who are um, on Medicare will be receiving some type of card with a $200 prescription benefit on it and that's supposed to happen before the election. And then Supreme Court justices for people to see, and I think they've come to realize, but for people to really, really see the impact of the courts and on everyone's daily lives, what these uh, appointments to not only the Supreme Court, but the federal judgeships, what that actually means for Americans, breaking that out so people can understand that we literally are at war and making life and death choices, particularly when you look at that chart and the delineation between what are non-farm jobs and then what are those jobs, the essential jobs that people are working day in and day out. So um, I think that that is something that could help those people who perhaps were not voting because it's not a persuasion election, but perhaps for those people who weren't voting, just voting just because they didn't even know that perhaps they were eligible to vote because maybe they've not had someone really show interest in them around talking about specific issues, that this is a message that needs to go from home to home, 
um, from wherever people are and meet them to let them know you have to participate in this general election. This is the ad from the folks at Midas Touch. I want to play this before I go to Greg Carr and then back to uh, Dr. Spriggs. So watch this, folks. It just seems that the economy does better under the Democrats than the Republicans. It just seems that the economy does better under the Democrats than the Republicans. It just seems that the economy does better under the Democrats than the Republicans. It just seems that the economy does better under the Democrats than the Republicans. It just seems that the economy does better under the Democrats than the Republicans. That thing right there, Greg, again, this is where messaging matters. What has happened in this country is that Republicans have successfully attacked unions. They have successfully created in the minds of people that if you listen to us, you can be enormously rich one day, mm -hmm. but they're going to take your money. Numbers don't lie. If you look at the economy under Bill Clinton, what he inherited from George H.W. Bush, then you look at the economy that took place under George W. Bush, and then what President Barack Obama inherited, and then what he left with, then what now Trump has done, the, the numbers don't lie. But there's this mindset because the National Chamber of Commerce supports Republican candidates, and what that is, they are representing big business. They're representing CEOs. I don't even understand why the I don't even understand why the why the media. I don't do it on here. I don't understand why the media has made it a daily thing. Stock market going up, going up, going up. Like how it like I'm just trying to understand how has that now become a daily barometer? The stock market is treated like a weather segment. And local news is on national newscasts every single day. And that's what they've done. They have psychologically created the mindset that, oh, if a Republican comes in, business is going to boom. They're going to get rid of regulation. They're going to slash taxes. But who benefits, Greg? Well, not Roland. I mean, there's a reason why Bill Spriggs has lent his considerable intellectual gifts to the service of organized labor over the years. Every time, uh, my friend and brother opens his mouth, I learned something about the economy. I think, uh, of course, Reese and Erica are right. If this message is drummed enough, it may put this election at least in a position where it'll be a little bit more difficult to steal. But here's here's really what's at stake. This isn't really about information, in, in a sense. It is indeed about marketing. And the reason why they include the stock market is because they, they are speaking to their interests. This is commercial news entertainment media, and that's what's mm -hmm. important to the owners. You see, you know, I think a lot of this is being driven by a fundamental misunderstanding of the modern world system and the nation state. Corporations are only situationally domestic. You see, they really don't care as long as they're extracting value and extracting profit. That's why the evisceration of organized labor over the last uh, 50 years has been so important, whether it be in the courts, the state legislatures, the federal legislature. Uh, organized labor is the way you fight back. But, the, but here's finally the problem we have with organized labor and in this country. You see, George Lipsitz wrote a book a number of years ago called The Positive Investment in Whiteness. It has been white nationalism that has been used as a wedge to keep those stupid white voters away from their class interests. And as a result, from the end of the Civil War to now, at peak moments when corporate profits have been threatened, the move has been to appeal politically to white nationalism. So people will continue to believe that they can become rich in, by the way, a global capitalist system that is, that is on the verge of collapse. And what you're seeing here in the United States in terms of this appeals to white nationalism is being replicated across Europe. It's in Latin America. As these corporations continue to make uber profits, we've seen a multiplication of billionaires during this uh, pandemic. We've seen the rich get so much richer and they don't really give a damn about the poor, except when finally in a moment you have to have people vote to put the legislators back in that you have bought. And in order to, for that to happen, you've got to appeal not to their economic logic, which is deeply undeveloped to begin with. Everybody can't be rich in a capitalist society. But you appeal to the 
illogical thing. And the illogical thing is race. So you can run all those commercials till the wheels fall off. As long as Donald Trump is holding up that Klan sign and pushing for white nationalist terrorism, those fools are going to go out there and vote against their class interests, and these corporations are going to sit back and laugh as they continue to get Mitch McConnell and them to push through tax breaks and continue to eviscerate labor. And that's what Bill Spriggs, part of his work has been. we got to knit to get this labor coalition together. Otherwise, the L that the people in this country is going to take it's certainly going to be racial, but it's going to be a whole lot of white people on the street, too. This is the thing with messaging, Bill. Um, and again, look, th this is the world that I live in, in media. The language often spoken is, oh, if, if the Democrats come in, we're going to lose jobs. And so here's what happens. Jobs becomes the kryptonite. Every politician, uh -oh, lose jobs, lose jobs, lose jobs. And so then... The worker, the consumer, the voter goes, oh, my God, that's me. I'm going to lose jobs. So if we vote for this Republican, they're going to save our jobs. They're going to save the jobs. And so it's language. And what has happened is they have successfully created this psychological notion that Republicans are about entrepreneurship, creating business, making an opportunity for you. Uh, you can make as much money as possible, but then when you look at income inequality and then you look at how that's expanded under Republican presidents, it's because they cater to those who own the company, not those who work for the company to make those owners bigger and better. That is the formula. That's the formula, and it's also the ignorance of the American people. Uh, the way in which it gets explained to people is the trickle-down story works because if I have regulations, I can't hire workers. If you raise wages, I can't hire workers. You're going to raise my cost. And so people believe that these job creators are actually a thing. And it's that miseducation that convinces them that even though the data clearly show creating more inequality, cutting back on regulations, cutting back on wages makes the economy collapse. Just like you said, what happened? George H.W. Bush can't handle the savings and loan collapse. The economy sags. Bill Clinton comes in fastest growing economy in U.S. economic history. George W. Bush takes over the fastest growing, most successful economy ever in American economic history and crashes it. It takes him all of eight years just to get back the jobs that he lost in a little tiny recession in 2001. And then in the Great Recession, he loses all the jobs and leaves to Barack Obama Fewer people on the payroll than, than when George W. Bush took office eight years ago. Eight years, negative job creation. Then you have Obama having to heal that and then launch the longest consecutive string of job creation in U.S. labor history. The lowest unemployment rate for black people that any president ever inherited. And this bozo crashes that. So this idea is it's clear that it's not the way on the record, but in Americans' minds, they don't understand how jobs are created. Jobs are created when you make the pie bigger. They don't get created by you stealing jobs from me. And that's what happens when you cut regulation, cut wages, you cut the purchasing power of workers. You make the pie smaller. You can't create more jobs by making the pie smaller. That's why every time they collapse the economy, because eventually the pie gets too small and there's nothing to eat. And then you got the crows picking. So if you want to change it, we economists have to do a better job of explaining to people how do you really create jobs. And you don't do it by trickle down. No, 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 no. I, I, you know what? Actually, no. Here's the deal, though. I, I'm, 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 I'm not gonna push back on it, but, but, uh, but, mm -hmm. I'm, but I'm, 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 I'm going to uh, explain it better. Here's actually the real deal, Bill. 
The problem is, and I will say this, the fundamental problem is that in media, they don't have economists on talking about the economy. What the reason Donald Trump is in the position that he is in is because networks like CNN and Fox News and other media outlets kept going back to Donald Trump talking about the economy. I was, look, this actually happened. I was at CNN. I was on the air one day with a Heidi Phillips and somebody else. And, and I said on the air, the next time Donald Trump is on CNN, we shall run a crawl at the bottom that says, this is for entertainment purposes only. I got an email from Ken Jouts, the executive vice president at CNN, who is still there. He is in the top, he is on the management team at CNN. Got an email said, do not criticize Donald Trump when he's coming on our air. And I said, hell no. And that night, Obama gave, it was a, a speech or something like that. I forgot what it was. Might have been a State of the Union or something like that. And Donald Trump was on Piers Morgan's show. And I got just so sick of the bullshit, I just started tweeting like, why in the hell are we listening to him? There are other real CEOs with real companies we can talk to. But no, what media does is they will put the, they'll put Jamie Dimon, J.P. Morgan Chase, to come talk about the economy when Jamie Dimon is not trying to actually speak about the economy from a broader perspective. They'll go to Goldman Sachs. They'll go to these CEOs, but they actually won't talk to folks who don't have a, rip, to be honest, a vested interest in it shifting one way or the other. That's the problem, Bill. That's the problem. Uh, th this, that's, that's what Greg was pointing out. The point of the media is to underwrite the corporations. And it's underwritten by corporations. So, yes, they, and, you know, this happens all the time. I have so many students who say, I'm really interested in the economy. I watch Suze Orman all the time. And I'm like, <laughs> so, yes, this is, this is the media giving us the entertainment that underwrites their broadcast and underwrites their perspective. But Americans do buy this trickle-down idea, and it is unfortunate because it doesn't work. And as often as we repeat it, the error, people don't absorb that it doesn't work. They don't hear enough times. They don't have enough economists on enough times. So thank goodness you have, uh, you do have really economists on. I love when you have Julianne on and others. And uh, it's it's necessary for us to repeat to our own people. It doesn't trickle down. My right. grandfather was a gardener. And if you water roses from the top, you get leaf rot. You don't <laughs> get better roses. You get leaf rot. You water roses from the bottom. All right. Mm -hmm. by watering. Great, great words there. Dr. Bill Spears, we certainly appreciate it, man. Thank you so very much. Thanks for having me. All right, All right folks. Thanks for having me. Thanks video in just one minute. As our community comes together to support the fight against racial injustice, I want to take a second to talk about one thing we can do to ensure our voices are heard. Not tomorrow, but now. Have your voices heard in terms of what kind of future we want by taking the 2020 census today at 2020census.gov? Now, folks, let me help you out. The census is a count of everyone living in the country. It happens once every 10 years. It is mandated by the U.S. Constitution. The thing that's important is that the census informs funding, billions of dollars, how they are spent in our communities every single year. I grew up in Clinton Park in Houston, Texas, and we wanted, to, we wanted new parks and roads and a senior citizen center. Well, the census helps inform all of that and where funding goes. It also determines how many seats your state will get in the U.S. House of Representatives. Young black men and young children of color are historically undercounted which means a potential loss of funding of services that helps our community. Folks, we have the power to change that. We have the power to help determine where hundreds of billions in federal funding go each year for the next 10 years. Funding that can impact 
our community, our neighborhoods, and our families and friends. Folks, responses are 100% confidential and can't be shared with your landlord, law enforcement, or any government agency. So please take the 2020 census today. Shape your future. Start at 2020census.gov.